Joe, are you up for a oh, sure. Most gracious, almighty, heavenly Father, we come before you at this time to thank you for this opportunity to study your word, for your grace and for your mercy. We pray that you would guide us and direct us and help us to understand these amazing final events that will happen before your son returns and maybe be spared from seeing the darkest of the judgments on the earth and be taken with your son before all of that happens, Lord. We pray that you would watch over us and keep us under your wings and support us with your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, tonight we're going to start clean right into chapter 17. Um, it's, a, it's a very good starting point. Um, you know, a lot of time in the last two chapters because they, they were a lot longer than the rest of the chapters in front of us. But anyway, uh, this chapter 17 it's about the attributes of the scarlet colored beast and the great four. We're going to look at those in detail. Um, this is going to be about the final morphing of the system. And we have referenced chapter 17 off and on through uh, this class. I've constantly jumped in just so you can see what John was seeing was coming in the future. But now we're there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to line things up uh, to see the whole picture in this one class because we've kind of been hitting it with the different beasts and then we go into Napoleon and then there was something else and then another beast and then a dragon. So, but this is the culmination of everything uh, in the future. So uh, a lot of my thoughts uh, came from uh, this uh, study uh, I did with uh, uh, Daryl and Susie and I think in Leah uh, read through this book for a while, The Grand Structure of the Apocalypse by H.T. Uh, Bartholomew. And it was, it's very good if you can ever, uh, ever looking through it. It's, it's very easy to understand. It's actually just a spiral paper uh, a book, uh, but it was very helpful in pulling some of these thoughts together for this place in, in my class. Um, and one of the things that was said in there, uh, by uh, uh, Bartholomew, and I don't think he's a Christadelphian. Uh, Gerald might correct me on that, but uh, he, yeah, he's had, what, he is a brother? Yeah, that's a brother, yeah. I know the brother. I, I didn't remember because we. I only really referenced him here in this class. But anyway, he had said this in his book, um, uh, going into 17, removal of the seat of the empire from Rome and the absence of secular competition allowed papal authority to grow up and develop its secret strength by the side of imperial power, constantly repressed in its slow but steady advancement to supremacy. And I thought I, I put that in there because I thought it was just a very good way to explain all this history we've been looking at in a paragraph. Uh, and uh, we're going to see that end of that slow, steady developing and uh, like I say, where it is today, and which we've talked about many times, but I, I felt it was very necessary to uh, line everything up now that we're at chapter 17. So um, anyway, we're coming to chapter 17 here. Um, it, I want to read the chapter and just listen to it uh, very well. Gerald, would you be willing to read this chapter for me? Sure. Okay. You hear me okay? Yeah. And just listen to the, we're going to look at the detail that we're given in this chapter. We are given a lot of attributes to consider, and we're going to start breaking into that tonight. I'm using the uh, New King James Version. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, my voice doesn't uh, act upon. All this pollen in the air is kind of acting up on them. So let's see how that's going to go. <clears throat> Verse 2, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness 
and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her head a name was written, Mr. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Jesus said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb and the overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw, where the harlot sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their heart to fulfill his purpose, to be of one man and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Okay. As you can see, just uh, listening to that, of all the, the many details that were given uh, to be sorted out, and a couple of those verses sound like a riddle to be solved. And we're going to look at that. I don't know if we'll get that far tonight about this eighth head that comes into the picture, but yet it's not a head. Um, it's, it's with the seven. So there's a, like a riddle to be uh, solved, which is very interesting, and we'll get there. Um, but anyway, uh, there is a whole lot to look at, and the brethren of the past centuries did not see the process of this beast unfold in the detail that we have seen today. And that's one of the blessings we have to live now, um, to, to under, be capable of reasoning uh, sufficiently what this is all about and how we should uh, uh, I guess grab a hold of it. So let's, um, moving forward, um, we're going to just take this one verse of time and we're going to take each. First, we got to kind of look at the story that is given there. And then we're going to go back and look at each of these attributes that are applied to her and to see how they line up uh, with what's going on. And many things, by the time uh, we get to this, everyone who was in this class from the start will be familiar with everything you're going to see. But what we're going to see is it all put together. It's like taking all those pieces that we looked at and, and lining them up and seeing uh, the whole picture in this one chapter about this situation. So, um, but we're going to be learning about, obviously, its final demise. So let's go ahead and uh, take this first verse and uh, let's see. Joanne, I got you next on my screen. I know Gerald just read it, but now we're going to go verse by verse and look at each one of these things. 
Okay. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vows and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto you the judgment. Can't see below that. Of the great. Or that sits upon many waters. I can't see the bottom. Okay, yeah, it says uh, the great boar that sits upon many waters. So once again, let's, I got this picture here with John listening and writing things down because one of the seven angels that had the seven vials that we just went through is now coming and talking to him. So once again, we're taken to our opening scene as if I've showed you all this stuff up to now. Now I'm going to show you this uh, final judgment that's going to take place. Um, and if you, let's see, um, if you would read this to Joanne. I lost it. Sorry. It, okay. You got it? Okay. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, spiritual immortality, and the inhabitants of the earth have made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Okay, so it says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And we've talked about this before, that this is just spiritual immorality that they have uh, aligned themselves with. That's why she's called a whore, but it's not the, the sexual things of so much that we know in natural life, um, but it is this so there, take, huh? There's a giant bumblebee behind you. So if you would get up, I right, can open the window. We have, have a bumblebee move. in the room. <laughs> I need you to move over here so that I can open the window and let him oh, okay. out. <laughs> He's got a buzz going on. Yeah, I'm trying to help him. He's not really listening. Watch the other one. Try to let him out. There we go. Pretty nice. They just love all the flowers out there. There's a, there's a you know, huge cherry tree, so they're having a ball. Yeah. All right. The bee has left the building. Okay. Um, just looking at this verse, this uh, spiritual immor in other words, they've aligned themselves with her, um, and they've been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. In other words, they've taken part of what she has uh, in this cup of hers. So going to the next verse, um, let's see who's next. Uh, Afonda, would you read this? Sure. Revelation 17, three. So he carried me away in the spirit unto the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and 10 horns. Okay, well, we've, we've talked about these things before, but we're given a whole lot to look at here in this final phase. Uh, remember um, the sea beast that rose out of the sea. We're gonna look at that um, as, as one of these times and it had the name of blasphemy and it had the same number of heads and horns. Um, but keep in mind, John is seeing the final phase of the beast looking forward in time. Um, he's seen all these other beasts, but he's watched it change uh, uh, or that it was going to change into finally this um, creature that we've talked about so much. So I know, I know we're all familiar with this this time. So let's move on. First of all, we kind of got to go through these verses and just put the pieces together. And then we're going to um, look at the details of this. Um, from our time, we now see how history has brought it to pass. This is the beauty of it because we're witnessing. We, we can read in books about how it passed where John was seeing it in the future. And so the time that we live in should be precious to us. Um, and we can see those details that John uh, marveled at. And again, in this picture, the artist understood that. That's a, a, a Vatican there in the back. Um, uh, Fonda, read this also and probably the next slide too. 
Okay, Revelation 17, 4. <clears throat> and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. Okay, here we have that fornication that the kings of the earth have um, taken part in with her. Um, and then here's, uh, read this all. Yes, 75, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So we can see that the emphasis, there is an emphasis put on these words. Now, I don't know if John wrote it in a way that made, the, I got this from the King James, and it's, all the words, letters have been capitalized. Perhaps the writer was pushing this, but maybe it was written in a way from the old uh, manuscripts to highlight it that way. But this is the one place in the Bible that you find this whole thing capitalized. Now, I don't know the history on that, why it got capitalized. If, if anybody knows, I'd love to hear it. Um, but obviously it's pushing this point to be understood of the seriousness of the history. Yes. It seems to me that uh, the reason for the capitalization there is, it, is that it is a uh, proper noun. Uh, it's it's um, it's the name that has given her yeah, it's what she is called or the proper noun the name that she is given so you know that I think that's the reason for the capitalizing of of the name there even though it's a long name you know it's like, like Roger Anderson but it's still the name of that uh, woman that John is being sh uh, shown now that, that so it's a proper noun that uh, is the reason that it's capitalized I think um, but even proper nouns aren't capitalized all the way through the word. That's why I, is that what you're referring? Yeah, to? I don't know whether it was written in a way that the writer, the translators would have taken it that way. Um, I've never even considered it until I sat here this moment. Um, but if, if anybody knew anything on it, it, and you're right, Gerald, this is like the name or the title mm -hmm. of this one. So but there would be emphasis on it because it's identifying her. It's, it's something that as we go through it, that it's trying to identify her. So uh, whether history recorded it that way or the translators it did, somebody recognized uh, the emphasis here, which is what this is all about right here. And we're gonna look at these details here that were in, in history and and uh, and coinage and things like that about all of this. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, let's see who's next. Um, I haven't asked for a while. Mike is Mike there, Fonda. Hmm. I'd like to involve him if he's there. Um, hey, Mike. Hello. <laughs> uh, I'll get you to read this next verse here. Okay, Revelation seventeen six. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great wonder. Okay, here's what is in that cup, the blood of the saints. And that's a, a, a real abomination because it means if she's drinking their blood that she extracted it from their bodies, so to speak. And she's drunk on it because it's her power. Um, it's what it represents power over the people and the ones that would not submit to her um, they lost their lives and this and we talked about it before but if you weren't here this wonder with great wonder uh, some other translations may have it a little different but it's not like wonderful it's not like oh what a wonderful thing this has become it's wonder in amazement um, that you, you're almost set back by when we, like when we hear about something um, that happens that's really a, a, an atrocity and we wonder at it or we are amazed by it. Um, so not to be confused, this isn't a good wonder, this is a bad wonder. So, so, the, so the current expression would be, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so anyway, it's just, uh, I'll say something here right now, Cole. It's kind of like when Russia, you know, went into Ukraine and started doing all it. The, the, the world was just amazed that he of his boldness. And of course, they hated everything he's doing. It was horrible. And many people have died for him. So that's, a, but they're wondering what on earth came into this person to, to think that they could do this thing. And then when Putin said to Zelensky, you sank my battleship, <laughs> he was very surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Wolf. <laughs> so we also keep in mind that the word harlot or whore, its root word is actually founded in idolatry. And we see that he's speaking of an idolatrous group of people. Right easily connected to this particular system of religion we're looking at, mm -hmm. then it's no surprise that the woman be drunk with the blood of the saint, since those kind of heathen and pagan things require sacrifice mm -hmm. of blood from them. Yeah. So it kind of all fits together in the symbolism that you see this thing. Mm -hmm. And you you loaned me the book, The Two Babylon. Yeah. I'm still reading that. I was going to ask for them back today. <laughs> so I'm still reading. That's a hard read. I tried. I gave it's it very, <laughs> very complicated. I couldn't stay with it. I really tried. <laughs> I'm still in chapter one, but I'm getting it. I found it fascinating. Anyway, it is fascinating. It is totally fascinating. If you can <laughs> grasp it uh, to that in the way you wrote it. So, so anyway, I wanted to, to make that point yeah. as, you're, as you're going through. So you see the woman drunken with the blood of the saint and the blood of the martyrs. Of Jesus, you're thinking of her requiring these sacrifices mm -hmm. because the true martyrs and believers in Christ don't believe in her system of things. Mm -hmm. And so they've given their life in sacrifice to this idolatrous uh, religion and organization. Okay. Now, I think we have to remember that uh, the apostle John is the one viewing this vision here before him. And that's why he said, I saw the woman. So it's the response of the apostle there in, in, in uh, extreme amazement at what he is seeing in the vision. And that is this woman, this heart of woman, being drunk with the blood of the saints and of the martyrs of Jesus. It was almost in a, in a, a state of unbelief that John was viewing this, this vision. And that's why I think he says, I, I marvel with great amazement that such was happening, you know. No, going to happen. Yeah, he yeah. knew he was in the future, that this system that he's been seeing unfold, how bad it got or was going to get. Remember, he's looking from it hadn't happened yet. We're looking back. We've seen, we've read it in the history books of, of how it's happened, like with the Holy Roman Empire and all the Inquisitions and things of that nature. So, um, anyway, uh, if there's ever any, I just don't want any confusion on this wandering. Like, oh, that's compelling. I wonder what that means. No, he's he's amazed at how far it's gone. Um, as I said, this image is a snapshot of the rise of Catholicism or the apostasy of the church on the back of this Roman beast. And we've looked at many aspects of it. As we have seen at one time, she was at one time in the past, and we're going to talk about it again because she's going to be dealt with again, that she was part of the beast in the, in the, uh, in the past. And now she rides this beast, something we've talked about a, a number of times. But it comes up here, so we have to look at it. All right. Um, yeah, Brother Roger, if you, if you look at the King James Version and the wording there, the regular King James, uh, it says, I wondered with great admiration. When I saw it, I, he said, when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Well, it wasn't uh, something that he was admiring, uh, this uh, view of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus being uh, being uh, desecrated by the woman uh, it wasn't but with admiration so that's that's an incorrect translation you know that that you're alluding to there but if you were of that system you might put it a different way <laughs> so whoever translated yeah but what I want to say here this is something I've only only thought about recently on um, what we are we're about to look at the de demise of the system and it's not ancient history but our future and our part in it what we're seeing is still in our future i mean it's it's gotten to this point but the demise of it is in the future even our future and it's so important that we 
I'm going to use the phrase, take ownership of it and embrace it, because hopefully we're going to be part of that, bringing it to its demise uh, through Christ. Uh, and this was this whole story was given to us as a blessing if we consider ourselves as servants, as we are referred to in the opening verses of this book, where it's called, he has given this to his servants. And if that's who we are, then we have to see ourselves in this future thing that's going to take place, not just something that, well, it's going to happen and I'm going to watch it from my easy chair on the TV or something. No, at this time, best I can tell, the demise of this creature, that Christ will be in the earth. So, which means the resurrection will have already taken place. So just keep that in mind as we go through. Now, um, although there were seven heads, they came one at a time, like the four horses of the apocalypse. It's not just, you know, we talked about this before, these seven heads and 10 horns. They are a time capsule of, of, of different uh, rising of powers. Um, so let's look at how this beef morphed through history. We're, I'm going to line it all up now, everything we've talked about, and it will all be familiar to you, but today we will, we will line it all up together at one, one time. Of course, we have to start back at Daniel's vision, which we, we've brought this up several times. This was uh, Babylon. Uh, Persia was the bear. Greece with the, these empires that would rise up after Daniel's time. And of course, there was the one that we saw that was more diverse than the others, and that became Rome. And just a quick, let's read this verse here. Uh, Patsy, you're next. Can you read this? This is Daniel 7. We go back to where we start hearing about these creatures. Daniel 7, 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. Okay, there we have the 10 horns and great iron teeth. And in Nebuchadnezzar's image, uh, what was the kingdom of iron? Rome. You see the connection there. He has these iron teeth. Um, so, but we, at this time, when Daniel saw what he saw, he had, it was one head with 10 horns, which would mean there's these powers coming in the future that have, do not exist. And what we're going to look at is, is Rome and all its faces. So when we come up now, looking back at Revelations 12, uh, we start to see this creature uh, uh, again developing and Again, we've been through this, so uh, let's see who else is up there. Uh, David, can you read this, please? Revelation 12, 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Okay, so here we see the multiple heads being added to the progression of these visions um, but we have seven heads and ten horns but the crowns uh, uh, that we're going to see uh, here it might even be in the next verse um, well, a lot of history has unfolded since John's time when we get to this point um, but um, let me see uh, I, I lost my oh yeah here we go I gotta watch my slides there's seven heads uh, have crown and 10 horns, but what it is, the crowns are not on the horns, the crowns are on the heads, so something hasn't been crowned yet, but the existence of their future is starting to show, and uh, this was about pagan Rome up to Constantine, so um, Daniel to Constantine is about 800 years. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. It's no more than, no less than 700, but it's approximately 800 years to this time to Constantine from when Daniel saw his vision of that diverse beast. A lot of time has passed. Um, of course, then we have the next phase of this dragon with these horns and crowns on its head. And you notice in the picture that crowns are on the the 
the heads, but not on the horns. Um, so let's see, Nancy, you're next. Can you read this? This is Revelations 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Okay. Um, it might be, uh, keep reading, Nancy. Having seven heads and 10 horns and upon his horns, 10 crowns and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. Okay, so here was we, when we went through 13, this dragon was given its power. It's, I don't, I'm not gonna bring up all those verses again, but he was given it to this beast rising out of the sea. And when he does, uh, cr the crowns are now on the horns. This is a significant change in what's happening of this thing developing because now the kings are starting to develop and, and come into play where before it was looking forward to those kings that would come. And the other element that was given to it was this name of blasphemy, meaning obviously it is a religious order uh, of some sort or has power with the kings as a religious order. Um, and the, obviously this system is something that is going sour uh, from away from God, not if it's got the name of blasphemy, it's obviously not in the Jesus' court, that's for sure, although it, it might portray itself as that. And then, um, oh, I already said that, um, I got ahead of myself, the Roman dragon, and this is the papal system starting to develop um, in the kingdoms of men. Of course, the next phase was uh, this, let's see, uh, who am I missing? Anybody else up on the screen there? I think that's right. All right, all right, go ahead, Joe. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. Okay, this was the next uh, advancement in this system, the two horns, and we looked at that before. We have the two horns, um, which became the combined forces of church and state. And we looked at, you remember very well, uh, when Charlemagne was crowned by the first Pope. And uh, that was on Christmas Day, 800 AD. So we're, we're now 1600 years approximately past Daniel's time. And for the first time, an emperor is crowned by a Pope. Um, and the Holy Roman Empire has come into place. So I wanted to line all that up, even though we've looked at all before, but when we see it in progression, if anybody was struggling with all of that and remembering it, I wanted you to be able to remember it as we come to the, this final phase to be judged. This is the last and final morphing. Now, what we're gonna do, we're gonna look at the attributes of this final beast and we will get a fuller understanding to what John is seeing. Um, so we are now at this time, approximately 2,600 years since Daniel's time to the full formation of this beast. And that's approximate. But um, as we can see, that's, that's a lot of years that this thing took to get where it was. And John was sort of on the first, second, third of this thing when he was living. So, all right. So, um, Okay, I'm going to read this because I got to bring these slides in uh, at a certain point. So 17.4, uh, it says, and the woman was arrayed in purple, and I believe I showed this before, and she was arrayed in scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. We can see that <coughs> it even prophesied how the colors that she would wear, and I think it's no coincidence that they dress this way. This, and the gold, if, we're, if you ever wanna learn about um, the wealth of uh, the papal system, there's a book, I've, I mentioned it before, it's called um, Vatican. The Vatican Billions. Yeah, it, yeah, there's a couple of them. Out. One of, I read was Vatican Exposed and it they is. have so much wealth today. They, nobody even knows what they have because there's only one man that's allowed to keep the books. And they have autonomy from tax collectors and everything else. They're not, it, it, it's an amazing story of the privacy they have in their financial affairs. 
uh, to where we don't even know how much wealth they have, and they won't and it and they won't share it. So anyway, that's I'm not going to get into and that. And they keep asking for more money. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, it's just unreal. And they, yeah. You know, when you visit Central and South America, it becomes really apparent, and it's so sad because the cathedrals are the biggest building anywhere in town, mm -hmm. and the, the rest of the people are constantly led to believe that they the only way is to keep giving money to them, and they're living in poverty. So it's just it's really sad. Right. Yeah, uh, and they're poor, and the, the church is rich. And it's just obvious and. Scripture told us that this was going to be that way, and it's, to me, it's it's very compelling to consider. Anyway, so here's some some new stuff you haven't seen. Um, it says that in that verse, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication, and we've talked about this before. They actually minted stuff that showed who she was and why they could not see that, or it's amazing. But look here. This was a, a meant, this was struck in 1825 by Pope Leo the 12th and a woman and it's a woman holding a cup in her hand and she looks it, like a sitting statue of liberty yeah there you go I, that's true it does it looks like it's sitting on top of the world right yes I'm, I'm getting there I'm getting there <laughs> it says the inscription is sedet super use of your, your versa and that means the best i could find she sits upon the universe and of course the word catholic means universal church and if you notice she is sitting on the world um so this cup is holding this woman is holding a cup in her hand as scripture said and sitting on spiritually ruling over the world and this is only something somebody pointed it out. I, know, I didn't pick it up before, the, the, the actual horn. So she appears to have seven horns coming out of her head. Um, now, whether or not they're horns, but there are seven of them. And perhaps they're trying to identify themselves with the seven horns on the lamb that is opening the seals of the scroll. You remember in the opening that the, the lamb was seven horns and seven eyes. She may be trying to make that connection there. I do not know. I do not know the history on that, but it's very clear of its, its world domination. These, again, are guideposts through time that God has provided for those of us who are watching. Um, okay, watching our time here. Now, concerning uh, Babylon's overthrow, we need to look again uh, just real quickly of the old days before we look at the new days and the parallels. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but we've been here before, but I don't think I put these verses up before. Um, this is, uh, we're gonna, whoever reads here, let's see, uh, Walter, you're next. Why don't you read? Okay. Jeremiah 51, four and five. They shall fall down slain in the land of the Chaldean and wounded in our streets. But Israel and Judah have not been forsaken by their God. The Lord of hosts, the land of the Chaldeans is full of guilt against the Holy One of Israel. Um, and this one also. Flee from the midst of Babylon. Let everyone save his life. Be not cut off in her punishment. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. Repayment he is rendering. Them. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand, making all the earth drunken. The nations drank of her wine. Therefore, the nations went mad. You see, here's that counterpart of the cup in God's hands and the cup in the woman's hand. Uh, we looked at that of the two, the two cups there probably about three months ago. Um, there's always seems to be a counterpart um, of the Lord's to the things that he's showing. But this is back when Jeremiah was living at that time and Babylon was overthrowing. And Babylon's now old day, old day Babylon's demise is being talked about here. But we see parallels about the cup, golden cup, drank of her wine, and then they said went mad. It doesn't mean they all just went sane, but there's madness in her uh, teachings and things of that na nature, which we, we look at today when we look at the Trinity. It just seems like madness. It doesn't make sense. Um, but anyway, they were uh, made drunk with her. And then we have 
uh, this verse here. Uh, Linda, you want to read it? Revelation 17, 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Okay. Now I'm going to show you a slide. Um, if, if anybody hasn't seen my class before, you might remember it from the past of this. They, uh, they embrace the word mystery, but yet here mystery is told as the identification of the system. And again, this is to me, the madness of it is that they don't, uh, see that when you're using this word, you're you're waving the red flag. Hey, I'm I'm the harlot. This is a uh, some of you might remember this from before, um, but this is a picture that even though this is several hundred years old, this actual one I'm showing you, they <laughs> still have images of, uh, just like this that, that they use to explain the Trinity. Um, and uh, here's what what they do. If you follow this, you kind of, it's kind of like a road map. It says the father, and you see a little line thing up there that says begets, and it begets the son. And then it says, together produced the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit as we call it, but they call it the Holy Ghost. Okay. Um, now, I've, I've mentioned this before, but what does this have a look like, this, this shape? Pelvis. It's a pelvis. So it's a womb. Yeah, it's the ovaries, the woman, mm -hmm. so to speak. It's just like, you know, uh, Mary, mother of God uh, kind of thing. Um, but down here on the right hand side, you see another way to explain it. It says, The Father is not the Son. The Father is not the Holy Ghost. And then it says that here, the Son is not the Holy Ghost. So there they're saying the Holy Ghost is something totally separate. The Son is totally, something totally separate. But then in the middle, it says God. And if you notice the three connectors from God, it says is. God is the Son. God is the Holy Ghost. God is the Father. You see, it, it almost- That it would just, be the most confusing thing Yeah, in this the world. is the madness. <laughs> it's just the total madness of it. Um, this is how they explain it. Of course, nobody can, it's a mystery. And uh, of course, we know that Mary uh, is called the mother of God. Uh, more madness uh, that comes into that with the Immaculate Conception and all of that stuff. But see, the thing is, is that once you do this, it keeps going. So Mary's mother was a God. Mary's grandmother was a God. <laughs> Mary's great grandparents were gods. I mean, you might as well go, they all turn into deities all the way back. So it doesn't it doesn't make any logical sense. Yeah. Well, they all had immortal souls, you know. So none of them died. Yeah. They were all demigods. <laughs> That's why you have over four thousand saints you can pray to. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm gonna show you something else. I got this off of this. I got this off a of Catholic website. This is what they say. Now look at this. It has one plus one plus one equals one, and down here at the bottom. This is called that they wrote this. This isn't something somebody put together to say, look how ridiculous it is. Savor the mystery. They savor the mystery. It's just amazing. And then here is the explanation that is put there with it. I'll read it because I got it in my head how I want to say it here. He says, while most find the humor in the above, there is more truth to it than meets the eye when applied to theological reflection and its illustration of the mystery of God as the Holy Trinity. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> that is the explanation for one plus one plus one equals one. Well, that is there. I can fix the math if you do one times one times one. That it does equal. <laughs> that, they just change the pluses right. into multiplication. But as we can see, they actually make websites where they encourage people to savor the mystery. And that is just to don't tell me that's not a guidepost that God has given us about this. They're not afraid of that word whatsoever, or nor do they apply it in a negative way. Also, uh, John Thomas and Eureka stated. And this is something 
that he knew in his time. I, I'm going to have to say I, I researched it. I could not find uh, the history on it, but obviously it was known in his time and maybe that history has been erased for this very purpose. He said, mystery is the inscription that's used on to be worn and engraved upon the Pope's tiara or triple crown, but removed by Julius III when it came to attract Protestant attention as evidence that the wearer was no other than the Antichrist. And I really, and I had heard that growing up and I tried to find it and honestly, I couldn't find it. And I looked for a long time, mm -hmm. but uh, somebody might have access. But obviously John Thomas had some access to it, but this triple crown he wears. And if I understand, history right what i read about it every pope gets his own personal crown made for him that's his and of course they'll end up putting it in a case he doesn't probably take it home and put it on the mantle. but um this and it represents my, my understanding is, is the trinity mm -hmm. um where the word written on the woman where was the word written on the woman it was written on her forehead and here he wears this on his head at these special times. Were you gonna say something else? Yeah, I can think. For a while, I think one or both of those two books that I lent to Joseph. I'm not gonna get it. Has a discussion about mystery written on the crown and stuff. I grew up with that just being taught, but then when I tried to find it, I couldn't find it. So I just put it out there. I did a purging probably. <laughs> I'm thinking they probably, if they could have removed that, they got it done. Um, but anyway, it's interesting. He still wears that trinity or that mystery on his head and everyone gets his own triple crown, which looks extremely uncomfortable to wear. So um, let's see. This is, now this is uh, Gibbons, the historian who wrote The Decline and the Fall of the Roman Empire. And uh, he, wrote, he said, the creed of mystery and superstition, which in the seventh century disgraced the simplicity of the gospel. Now, here's a man who, he wasn't a Christadelphian, obviously he was a historian, but from his own research and writing the, that, that five volume book, The Decline and the Fall of the Roman Empire, he certainly got this. Obviously he was Protestant, and uh, he saw it uh, in the way that we see it. It just, just has totally disgraced the simplicity of the gospel. Um, and he recognized uh, the influence that the church had on humanity. Um, all right, we, we've got a little bit of time left and just enough time to cover a couple other interest, what I call interesting slides uh, about this. This is the other thing. This. Um, on the right there is Dagon, the fish god, and the other side is the Pope's mitre or his hat. Uh, you can see the similarity. Uh, and I looked it up. Uh, Dagon is an ancient Mesopotamian, Assyrian, Babylonian, and Canaanite deity. He appears to have been worshipped as a fertility god in Assyria and among the Amorites. The Hebrew Bible mentions him as the national god of the Philistines. Um, he was, and then they got his head chopped off right. and his arms and legs chopped off with right. the Ark of the Covenant in there. Uh, with the temples of Ashdod and elsewhere in Gaza. And you remember, you know, when God fell over and his hands broke off and everything, this is their image of that. They it's, even, they even um, had this tradition of skipping over the threshold after that yeah. because his arms and legs broke and they had to jump over him. It's right there, Walter. I even got the page bookmark that refers to this. Oh, you, you found the history. <laughs> okay, well, uh, Walter's got the history here on that uh, mystery thing. Which page? Is yeah, it page. easy to read? Or? Gotta find where it begins on here. Oh, it's such like by bedtime <laughs> I, reading. I mean, if it's three pages or something, the work is. <clears throat> But this this hat thing comes out of um, ancient Babylon. Yes, that's like a giant fish this, yeah. on the head. It's Correct. just interesting. Dagon, Dagon. Yeah, that's yeah, what he was just going over. Dagon. 
Yeah. But it's interesting. I know I'm not saying they styled it after Dagon, but it's extremely interesting when you look at them facing each other. The similarities are amazing that they allowed these kind of things to develop. Yeah. It's the same system. It's from the very beginning. It just changes names and appearances. It's the same stuff. Um, you say this is the right page for the... It was the illustration. <laughs> But if you look at the index, it probably give you. Yeah, I need to find the yeah. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna move on. All right, I only got a couple more slides and I'll finish up real good tonight. And uh, Babylon the Great uh, in Hebrew, I you look it up, map Babel, and you look it up, it says confusion. <laughs> that is the word. That is Babylon, including Babylonia and the Babylonian Empire. So trying to understand the Trinity creates confusion, yet you are expected to accept it. And back through the Holy Roman Empire, uh, if you didn't accept it, uh, you became blood in her cup, so to speak. Um, that's just the horrors of this. And as John was seeing things like this, the, the detail he saw, we don't know. Uh, we know he saw something like what we're showing, but he knew he was doing something really bad, really bad. So it'll be interesting to hear his take on exactly what he saw right from his own mouth. It would be very interesting. So, so here is the, the great whores groups. And uh, um, that actually puts us within a couple of minutes of finishing. And I don't want to get on into the next thing because we get into those riddles. And that's, that'll take some time to explain. So, Walter, did you lock in on it? No, I was thinking maybe it was the other book. Oh. Well, maybe we could read it next week. That'll be homework. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. All right, is anybody, um, I know we've seen all this stuff, but I hope it was helpful just to line it up and, and real quickly as we go into it. So we are reminded of everything that we've already seen and learned and uh, watching the demise of this. So I hope that was helpful. Anybody want to contribute something? One last thing about oh. your coin. Oh. Now, we can see the images in it and what they mean to us, but understand when it was minted, who it was made for. The woman with a cup in her hand is symbolizing to them that she holds the cup of Christ. Mm -hmm. See, not what we're right. thinking of it. And then the rays coming from her head, that is enlightenment. That is- Are God. they rays? Rays. Is that, I yeah. mean- that, They're like sun rays, if you will, that come. Okay. That's what they're depicting there. This enlightenment, this, you know, God has touched me, you know. In those days, yeah. they had to put something around you. had to say, I'm divine. Like a halo or something. All that nonsense. Is yeah. somebody, the reason I said horns is, I yeah. only found someone online who talked about the corn says it looks like she has seven horns coming out of her. Which so, I mean, <laughs> their choice of seven there for the rays might yeah. have been a good idea. Yeah. I mean, it's similar to like what you see in the Statue of Liberty. Right. Idea. Yeah, it, does, it, does. It, it looks very much like the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. How many points are on the Statue of Liberty set in the does, does, does she have points on her head? She, she does. Like, she has seven. the same rays of light. Yeah. <laughs> So that could be that same goddess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, another version of it. Exactly. So it's all there. We can just see it's all, all in there. It's, it's fascinating stuff. It really is. Anyway, we'll get into the, some more detail about the heads and uh, these couple of riddles that appear to be here and cipher those out because they're really hard just to read through and wonder what it's talking about. Anyway, but I'll, I'll stop there. Nobody else has anything to add. Thanks for class, Roger. Good class. All right. All right. Well, David, would you close for us? Sure. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, and our God, once again we come to thee to give thee thanks for the privilege that we have had this evening to be able to assemble together to continue our study of thy word. And as we look at the thoughts that have been presented tonight, we pray that we truly understand 
the conflicts that have experienced would have been experienced through history and the things that we continue to battle with in regards to what is scriptural versus what is not. We thank thee for the many blessings, the care that thou hast bestowed upon each of us and continues to give to us. And we pray if it be thy will, at the return of thy son to this earth to reestablish thy kingdom, that each of us might receive a part therein. We truly ask for thy forgiveness of our sins and of our shortcomings. In Christ's name, we humbly approach thy throne. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. And guess what? Statue of Liberty, seven rays. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mike. I yeah. said that, but it was seven, great. You were right. Seven uh, points on her crown. It's on her crown, right? Yes. Yeah. It is. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, you had a great point when I was presenting for Canada last night. I thought that was like spot on. So thank you for jumping in. Well, I'll jump in whenever it seems to make sense. Yeah, he's uh, full of all those kinds of things. <laughs> Lots of trivia things. Uh, yeah. Tell them what you said, Mike. Tell them what you said last night because it was so good. You know, that whole mystery thing, um, you know, I was raised Catholic, and I went to Catholic school for many years, <clears throat> and um, in elementary school, um, they mixed the catechism in with the other subjects, and I was always asking questions, because I was like, wait a minute, what does that mean? And I don't know how many times I was told it's a mystery. So that was in the 50s. They were using the mystery thing in the 50s, teaching catechism. So there you are. Yes, yeah, we, somebody who's been there. It is, it is amazing how much they just, they just default to it's a mystery, then they don't have to explain it. You just go on and believe what you're supposed to believe. It's a default mechanism almost. So. Either that or they never talk about it, like in the Protestant churches. It was never brought up. You stood there and you, the whole congregation would say, you know, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And yet you never knew what it was and didn't ever question. It was never talked about. Fonda, I don't remember. It's been a long time. What was your background? Um, I had a Baptist and then Presbyterian background. And my parents were active you know like my dad bowled with the church league and we sang in the choir he and i mm -hmm. it was uh you know i had a very good upbringing <clears throat> but did they ever address this mystery thing or did oh, you ever... mystery so much they just never talked about it okay at least in my thought i mean the adult classes might have been talking about it but I never heard it. Well, I didn't hear it from, you know, up at the pulpit. They never preached on it. But it was still very, a very reverent place. And, you know, it was wonderful to have my parents have a Bible on their bedstand. You know, so. Anyway, I'm and thankful for, you know, those, uh, those things that we learned as children, you know. And they would, they set the finest example that anyone could ever have. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm curious, Mike, did you have a, were you allowed to have a Bible? Never, we never had a Bible. Um, I'm not sure if there was a Bible in the house. Uh, Your mom had a Catholic Bible okay. that had the uh, Apocrypha in the middle. There you go. <clears throat> Nobody ever read it. I mean, you know, it was never opened in any of the school or in the catechism or in you know, mass or anything like that. So um, they just produced their own literature. And Mike, of course, was attracted by the artwork, <laughs> you know, because of all the elaborate paintings and you know, like some of the things you were showing. You know, that attracted him. Okay. But it, part it, of it. What the, uh, mysteries. 
praise. Anyways, that's our two cents. Oh, great. <laughs> I think it's worth 35 cents. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. Sure, that's yeah, really that's good. good. Um, I'm, Mike, I was glad you're there. Except we don't see if you're there. We hear Fonda, but uh, it's very good to get your input because you came up that bad. Most of us never experienced that. We only hear about it or read about it. So it's it's always enjoyable to hear somebody's age. journey from that. Who is our past? Uh, so, so thank you very much. It's just an acronym. Well, well, thank you all for class. Okay. All right. Look forward to next week. Yes, ma'am. Good night. 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 He's here. Because. That's okay. I just was wondering. That's all. Yeah. Because it already had Roger Shea Anderson up there. So I was like.